Welcome to Feature Please, a hateful voyage through the Delta Quadrant. My name is Joseph. I'm Peter. Peter, it's only been a couple days since you and I talked Trek, so <laughs> twice in one week is is good for me. Just I know my these wife's so kinda... excited. She's she's just <laughs> she's so excited. Ah, yeah. So much of the week has gone to Star Trek Voyager. <laughs> Not only Star Trek, but Star Trek that I personally cannot stand. Mm. Yeah, we're recording this the same week we did our our live stream. So this is our first opportunity in terms of our perception of the time-space continuum to say thank you to everybody that came. A few more people than usual tuned in. We had a really lively chat. It was great. A lot of participation. Yeah, a lot of participation. A lot of laughs, a lot of of deep, thoughtful discussions. Um, This is going to be episode, what, 52 for us now at this point? Uh, it's actually going to, yeah, it's 52. You're right. For those of you who've been uh, trekking along, voyaging along from the beginning with us, thank you. It means a lot that, you know, we've got so many people out there who are willing to put the earbuds in and, and beam our voices talking about minutia of Star Trek drivel directly into your ear. <laughs> hey, we... uh we're happy that you find us entertaining enough that of all the stuff that you could be consuming right now, for, for whatever reason, f- you've picked us. And so we will not let you down. Uh, we, we're actually really happy to do it. And we're really happy to have had the the slow but steady uh, growth and interest and positive reviews and stuff like that. It actually means the world to us both. So thanks. And on that note, let's... Uh, Let's talk about our episode, Peter. What was it? Season three, episode 10, Warlord. So, Peter, in V'ger Please tradition, would you so happen to be interested in discussing the first frame of this episode? Uh, If I have a choice in the matter, I I would say no, because it was nightmare fuel. So, (laughs) (laughs) Starting a long time ago, uh, I started playing a game with this goddamn show where... When I start up Netflix, uh, I let the first thing come into shot and then I hit pause and I just let it soak in and you take whatever horror story they were trying to tell you in the thaw, right? The killer clown in the mind prison hell. And it has nothing on the scene. It's Neelix. And he's like, eyes crossed, tongue hanging out of his mouth, fingers like curled up on his chest making this like noise and it straight up looks like he's getting a bj he's he's not just getting a bj he is getting a first class bj at 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 which he he has reached the mountaintop it is frightening it actually like i recoiled from it in disgust when i initially saw it like Like, you know like i saw like a cockroach like (laughs) (laughs) Uh, it made me regret ever having decided to play this game with myself. And as I froze it, it made me regret agreeing to watch this entire series with you. I, I took a picture <laughs> and I put it up on the trauma support group with a simple question. What the fuck am I doing with my life? That this is what I'm choosing to do with my Tuesday night is see this lascivious shit. But <laughs> if only I could go back in time and tell my past self, do you see that guy over there? That guy at the vampire LARP we're at? Never fucking talk to that dude and definitely yeah. never agree to broadcast with him. Bad things will happen. Your life will get worse. Walk the fuck away. What do you think is worse? This picture of Neelix in his moment of uh, ecstasy or that creepy ass cloth hallway doll that we posted a long time ago? If you had to look, if you had to turn one of the, those two pictures into your background wallpaper on your computer, which one would it be? I think I would still do the Neelix O face because then I would be able to like gauge people's reactions Ooh. to what is a really disgusting image, <laughs> and I would I would be able to desensitize myself to it, like really like dig down in that whole you know future serial killer <laughs> vibe, just really like. Make it so nothing disturbs me. Well, I don't want to spend too much time on this first frame because one second later we get treated to another terrible frame, and that is Felix's Neelix's big Talaxian Hobbit feet. 
and he's Ugh. making this face not because he's getting you know his genitals struck. I don't, you know what? I take that back. I don't know. For all I know, Talaxian genitals are in their feet, and that could have really been like a handy. Um, <laughs> well, let's just call a foot massage a foot massage. He's got these big ass hobbit feet and the prosthetics are like these jet molded big rubber galoshes he's put on that are like contoured to have like toes and hair and toenails and all that other stuff but the problem is it's one big piece the toes aren't actually like cut and loose so it looks like felix neil <clears throat> geez i keep saying felix it looks like neelix's feet are fused into one big flipper they spend so much of this pre-credit sequence on these terrible feet prosthetics. It's amazing. Did no one did no one look at these shots afterwards and be like, this is bad. This is a terrible idea. We are showing people nasty feet, foot props that look terrible, that look shitty. Who who directed this? Who dis, who shot this? Can they be fired? Can they be fired out of a cannon? Like, what the Are fuck? Are they going to be directing a Marvel Disney movie 20-some years from now and have to lose their job once this footage is unearthed? Like, it's a rancid tweet. <laughs> I think the thought was maybe... Oh, you know, on TV, this stuff blurs and they'll never have 1080p or 4K displays out there at home to make this quality <laughs> clear enough where you see that this is just a, a knuckly flipper. But <clears throat> so what's going on here is uh, Neelix is lounged back in a chair and he has a female Talaxian rubbing his feet down. This is the first time we've ever seen what a female member of this species looks like, to my knowledge. Um, it is not anything I would want to take home to my mother. Um, and as Neelix is laying there getting his feet rubbed, you see uh, Harry Kim and Tom Paris in some okay looking civilian clothing. And uh, what's going on is Neelix has recreated a pleasure colony from the Talaxian. I don't know. The way he made it sound, I think this might have been on that moon that Jatral's people nuked. It was unclear to me if this was on Talax or if it was on the moon. Um, the idea, though, is that this is like a bougie one percenters club. Right. That uh, only the, the the lifestyles of the rich and famous of of his people got to enjoy. And correct me if I'm wrong, but he even says it's like, oh, it's a great place for relaxation and personal pampering and he winks like it's a knowing wink like it's a brothel did, did you get it's that? definitely uh how how to phrase this for those with an active imagination that's precisely what he meant for the purpose of network sensors it was deniable you know what i mean yeah the, wow that was. so much head cannon just sprung in here is the reason why we never see female Talaxians is that they're like some sort of weird trafficked commodity. Like, so you, you're, you're saying, are they like Ferengi females and they have like yeah. no rights? No rights or like, you know, they're just simply objects of sex and the men do all the trading and everything else. So he's going on, you know, it was an exclusive club and there's this delicious wine, which throughout this entire cold open, this episode's a really good example of how voyager can a lot of times pack a lot of really cool interesting stuff in the pre credit scene and i know we spend a lot of time on these episodes in you know the first third of the show but i think a lot of times that's where all the cool stuff really does take place and this episode's pretty good throughout but this scene in particular i i, I really like as far as all the stuff we've seen out of voyager <laughs> he starts ordering um wine and later on he orders chicken wings because you know it's not a party without food and you know where my mind instantly went was where the hell's all this food coming is is the holodeck using replicators is it holodeck food like holodeck lungs that just disappear but you get a lot of a lot of big questions come out of this scene but he lays it all out and says hey this is you know the low-key relaxed tropical resort and uh Paris is like, you know what this is missing is uh, a more exciting 
bartender and uh, more exciting drinks. And then Harry Kim's like, yeah, and my J.O. fantasy. Bring those volleyball players in here. <laughs> it's like, you know what this party needs? Ladies, hold on. I have a pre-programmed quote-unquote sports simulation. Oh, you're talking about par- <clears throat> Kim Sport Program Theta 2. <laughs> and he summons up these very... uh. 90s ladies in in bathing suits who are apparently a champion volleyball squad from the uh like early uh, 23rd century it's a hoe train uh, he he yeah, it's, a a hoe train. Train. It's, it's harry kim's personal hoe train he's learning from his boy tom gotta have you know your sex toys right we talked about this way back when, uh when we had our first kind of original uh introduction to sandrine's and uh, we mocked it for being uh, Tom introducing Harry to his sex toys. This is the, this is Harry reciprocating to say, hey, let me get my sex toys in here. Let me get my real dolls so that my best friend Tom and this filthy space cat <laughs> can have sex with them. That would be great. I want to I want to share this experience with them. This is this is Tom's deviancy starting to have a real impact on Harry Kim's psyche. Two things. One. Tom does not let this go unnoticed. Tom's like, uh, what sport did you say these were from exactly? Because the only sport I see associated with this is basically web slinging. And I'll let you draw your own conclusions on that. <laughs> and that's where Harry's like, oh, no, it's a uh, it's this volleyball team. Which is a second point, like these are real women that were historically relevant celebrities right right that he has just made up and it jumps back to the barkley conundrum you know when he's taking bridge crew officers on the enterprise and putting them into his jo fantasies as themselves where do you start (laughs) to draw the line on holodeck ethics and i think we've already come to the conclusion that it's real loosey-goosey but just think if you're one of the members of this holodeck or this uh volleyball team are there stats out there like how many times you've been downloaded to the different holodecks for um oh there's there's so many horrifying potential roads to go down here uh as you mentioned these are real people so that means there are people probably alive in the alpha quadrant that have to cope with the fact that some fucking douchey turd kid on a ship in the delta quadrant has turned their ancestors their great grandmothers <laughs> into sex fantasies because you know harry kim was doing like the foursome fantasy with all of them together yeah right like that's first that's that's the first mind-blowing thing and then second i mean it almost seems like an orville plot of the idea of do you have rights to your holodeck self to not be turned into uh, people's uh, sexy time like that's actually something that show could do and it would be funny and interesting yeah but but it it appears that uh, there's certainly like a social ban on doing that, as we saw through the Barkley stuff. Like it's it's bad if you if you turn your coworkers into sex objects. I have an out of character um, observation here too. Season three has been very heavy on the hot models jammed into Star Trek episodes, and this is something we talked about pretty heavily during the mess hall. Is the increasingly prevalent reliance on like a sex crutch for Voyager. Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of TNA like under the, the, uh, the Ferengi false prophets under boob for days. Like, but you had that, you got these girls here. Um, what was the one where Neelix was, uh, on the Kazon world looking for contact. And there was the stripper up on that. Like, oh, the strippers puzzle box. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The stripper puzzle box. I think it was alliances. Yeah. It, but that was season two. I, I want to say there's one other instance in season three where we've had girls, even in this episode, uh, later on, we returned to this holodeck simulation. You got Balana in a bikini. We covered this. We got into it. I, my opinion is pretty well known. This is, this is, uh, the producers thinking very little of their audience and thinking that uh, a bunch of TNA is what they need to boost the ratings. I guess it's worth pointing out, like at this point, their ratings are less than half they were at the beginning. Yeah. And 
while they would still be good by today's standards, uh, it's definitely a show is slipping. It's stabilized, but it's not certainly not growing anymore or hasn't grown in a long time. It hasn't recovered. Uh, they start making it seem like with Kim and Tom jamming all these different things and basically messing up this historically accurate creation that Neelix had that you think Neelix is about to flip out on Tom and be like, you've got no respect or this and that. But that's not it at all. Neelix loves this shit. And he oh, yeah. gets right into the groove. I thought it was a really awesome moment. You know, they've they've established that there's kind of a growing bromance between Neelix and Tom. And I think <laughs> this is just a really great scene that shows that off, that everybody's having fun and that this is going to be a cool new holodeck program for everybody to have fun. Unfortunately, Paris and uh, Kim get called off to uh, bridge duty because uh, space stuff happens and then cut to credits. Oh, not before we get a lingering close up zoom shot of Neelix's fucking feet again. And his oh, dance. Yeah, this, oh. is a, this is a pretty popular GIF. I've come to realize he's up there with <laughs> with the Harry Kim Ho train and uh, dancing to some Caribbean steel drum music. He starts cutting loose. And yeah, Internet history is made in that moment. Anyway, now that we've disposed of that scene. A scene that has almost nothing to do with the rest of the episode. Yet is, get to... is my favorite opening scene, I think, out of any of the episodes so far. <laughs> it was certainly entertaining. Uh, we actually get to a pretty good episode of Star Trek. We get the uh, disaster of the week, which is a, a ship is on fire. Uh, it's about to explode. There's a few people on board. And of course, our diligent crew gets them off the ship before... Uh, the detonation occurs. They're in sick bay where Kess and the doctor are trying to treat their new arrivals. Uh, they succeed in stabilizing two of the patients, but a third, a male, dies uh, pretty much immediately. There's nothing they can do to help him. And uh, this this man is clearly the husband of the one female survivor. and She is upset of course over her husband's death or at least appears to be upset i'm upset as well because everybody is laying on bio beds and the camera work on here is putting you parallel with the heads of these people and <clears throat> we have what i'm going to call the third installment in the saga of the shitheads oh yeah more aliens with more scaly crusty flat scabby shit glued to their head with little tufts of hair poking around like some sort of burn victim Barbie doll that was dipped. In I don't food. fucking understand this makeup crew's obsession with head delineating scabbed. aliens by putting crusty crap in their hair. It's disgusting and it sucks. And the face stuff that they did wasn't a big deal, but it was enough. I you loved, know, it was enough. I love the face stuff. And, and I'll get into what went me over. Yeah. So the face of these aliens, they've got like four tubes running down the bridge of their neck. And the first pair of tubes stop between the eyes and the second pair of tubes are like right over the nostrils. But like you don't even notice this at all because all you can see are these. I mean, they look like they're vidians basically like their heads look all patchwork mangy made out of different scalp type materials it's gross as hell but yeah out of these three people one of them is the wife the other one is a, a famous doctor and the third one was i don't know what they tried to pass him off as but he dies on the bed and uh, it's not a good time <clears throat> there's a cool exchange where kess is trying to save the guy and the doctor's like, hey, give him, you know, however many cc's of space juice. And I'm like, it's kind of stupid that they use the same or that they would even think to inject these strange chemicals into whatever species they come across. Like there's what's the odds that there's going to be a compatibility between these? And it's cool that they point out that in this case, there are none and the medicine is completely worthless. It is good that they that the doctor has like a failure moment and it's not like there's incompetence based. It's just, well, it didn't work out. We don't I don't think we ever see that. It's the doctor being impossibly good or the doctor malfunctioning and nothing in between. So I agree with you. It was nice to see a moment of like, no, these are aliens. We know nothing about them. We can't save them. 
shrug. And uh, the other two survive, though. And we cut to a scene up in Janeway's office where these two survivors are talking with Janeway about the fact that they got attacked. They blame the attack on basically random brigands that wanted their highway their ship. Yes. But the, I think there's there's a good indication in this scene that something's amiss because the lady that's the wife of the deceased is very, oh, I'm getting over it. Thanks to Cass. I'm fine. Which is just even for Star Trek, you know, like compressed timeline acting seems a little weird. And you know, they explain that they're going to go back to the their home planet. They've got apparently an autark that rules the planet. And of course, they're they're probably going to be super happy that uh, the two of them are you know alive and and no doubt thank Voyager for doing it. And Janeway's got a smile on her face like, hey, yay, I'm going to make friends for a change doing starfleet shit seems good seems all right and the episode continues on its way uh back to the holodeck yeah back to the holodeck where you see (coughs) neelix sitting there um and he's waiting for kess to come down and join him and check out this new program that they've made so along comes torres and neelix is like hey have you seen kess and she's like uh no and I forget how this exchange goes exactly, but I think the volleyball team walks by again and he's like, I I hope all the girls don't offend you. And, uh, you know, they were a modification by Harry. And she's like, "Uh, no, it's cool because I made my own modifications. And along comes some dude in like the most ridiculous bathing suit I've seen. Oh, yeah. This thing is like a piece of Kleenex over his butt. (laughs) And it's a piece of Kleenex over his junk and then three band-aids on either side taping these two pieces of Kleenex together. And yeah, they got Roxanne Dawson in a, a one piece swimsuit too. And it's just sexy time on Voyager all around. Yeah. Uh, I do love that. Uh, B- Balan is like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I too have sex toys. Yeah. Let me show you mine. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, packing uh some heat down under as was obvious because it's got a huge bulge that's right on camera and uh it's good times so uh i'm gonna go over here and we're gonna have a good we're having a good old time here uh standing the uh the holodeck walls and uh <laughs> really appreciate you uh making this resort so this narf narf is good this good. place i like it called uh the paxoa resort which is basically sex toys show and tell as far as Voyager crew members are able to decipher. And, this and, is definitely a filthy Federation sex den. Now, <laughs> if the, the question here is, is Bolana's sex toy based off a historic person? Is that a historic dong that we just saw? Mm. Like, and the guy, the, the actor they got for this guy, talk about him. He's just jacked. He's just like perfect looking. Yeah. Um, it's like, is that a real guy? Like, is that like a famous Olympian? Like, is that a thing? I'll also go ahead and point out here that scientifically speaking, since they got her in this bathing suit, um, she, if 50% of your family is human and the other 50% is Klingon, there is a lot of super recessive Klingon traits. Like nothing looks Klingon about the rest of her body. She has some ridges on her forehead and that is it. So Klingon DNA uh, to well, the contrary, I mean, like, it's very weak. We've, as far as we've seen other Klingon, like in states of relative undress, I, don't, I think that's relatively rare. And I don't think body wise, there's much different about Klingons. It's just the, uh, the teeth like that can, can get out of hand. You know, I think you can, you can justify the, the lack of teeth, uh, fang action to 50%. Don't they have um, ridging going down their spine, too? Not that you saw her back. Yeah, I mean, it. she could have some of that still. Mm. I don't think we really got a really good look of. Of, you know, I, I'm just saying, I don't think that there's like a ton of gnarly shit happening on the Klingon body. Yeah, well, um, on the main plot line, you got Kess with the widow 
and the other survivor, and she's kind of taking them around the ship and giving them a tour. It seems like things are getting closer. It seems like she's kind of growing into this role as a counselor, a, a sympathetic ear to cry on, or, you know, to, to lean on. And uh, that she's kind of starting to enjoy having friends and a life maybe outside of Neelix because it's pretty clear that she's given him the cold shoulder and, and ditching out on some dinner dates. Uh, he at one point calls her out to the, the holodeck program and is like, Hey, look, you know, we, we're going to do this lunch thing or not. She excuses herself from the tour that she's giving goes down and meets him and kind of gives it to Neelix. I felt bad for him. She's like, you know, you always do this. You want everything to be about you. It's okay if I have friends, but only if you're still the main focus and, I feel like you're smothering me. And basically, I think it's uh, going to be best if we spend some time apart and uh, put this whole thing on pause and then just gets up and leaves the table and leaves him completely gutted. It was a legit sort of relationship talk. Uh huh. It felt more real than sometimes the dialogue in the show feels because of its relatability. Yeah. I mean, you and I were obviously in marriages now. Uh, you know, we, we, we've gone through relationships where these kinds of things are known to us. And so it helps when they lean into something that's a little bit more realistic and relatable to the audience here because it helps you connect with. Yeah. Them. And. I liked it for that reason. Like everything that Kess said and everything that, that Neelix said, I understood. And it helped me like feel their characters out a little bit more. Like I wish this level of authenticity was present in more dialogue on the show. And thinking back to something that you mentioned actually at uh, the live stream about the feminine voice and like the best ver version of that we've seen, which is, was uh, the scene where Balana is, is talking to Janeway about, where it is Chakotay becomes weak to Seska's manipulations back in season yeah. two. Like this is an example of that. It felt like very authentic dialogue. Like you really like the characters connected with what they were talking about more. Maybe the actors did and it helped them yeah. present that better. And same thing here. Same thing here. Appreciate the task it is to turn Neelix into someone who is relatable. And that's absolutely what happens here. You know, from his perspective, everything's been fine. And she just kind of blindsides him with a turns out I'm not happy after all. And we're going to split up. And <clears throat> all this being after the major ups and downs with Paris and the tired ass jealousy plot and all that. When it finally looked like things were pretty happy between them. You're kind of just sitting at the table alongside Neelix as he gets blindsided with all of this. But um, off they go. Voyager arrives at uh, the homeworld. And I'm kind of shaky on what happens here exactly, because it appears that the president of the planet or one of his top advisors has agreed to beam up to Voyager to greet Janeway and to welcome the, the, the survivors back on. You've got Janeway waiting in the transport room with the two survivors. You know, their new BFF Kess is there. And then you've got random gold shirt transporter dude in the background who I think was uh, Ensign. Ensign Martin. Good old Ensign Martin. Well, what happens? So the representative gets beamed up. And then immediately, Keska, Keska, <laughs> kind of, Kess pulls a gat, murders the dick out of Ensign Martin and the guy who just beamed up. Like, boom, boom, they're both dead. Uh, and Janeway makes a, a run for the phaser and, and Kess is fighting her and is talking in a very different kind of authoritative voice. What happens is... Kess masterminds, or at least appears to mastermind, a very complicated jailbreak for these guys because what they do is they lock security teams out from getting into the transporter room. They then use the transporter to beam themselves onto a pre-programmed, pre-rigged shuttle. 
and then use that shuttle to escape Voyager. And then that shuttle has also been rigged to not be able to be detected by Voyager sensors. So some real fucking high tech, high ball, uh, you know, black ops moves. It's a brutal uh, scene too. You don't see Starfleet officers die very <coughs> frequently in Voyager. And you sure as hell don't see Voyager crew kill other Voyager crew. So this whole thing takes place in about a minute's time span with all of the death basically happening instantly. So it's a real out of nowhere moment. It makes a real strong punch and you're just kind of like, what the hell would have made sense for Kest to have shot Janeway and killed her. Maybe at the same time, I think if they would have done that, the, uh, what we'll ultimately find out to be the, the warlords imprint on Kess would have been guaranteeing that Voyager would have been a undeniable foe moving forward. But, yeah, man, just a, a, a brutal kill on both. They could have gotten away with stunning those dudes, and instead they went for the kill. Yeah, they they actually end up murdering a lot of a lot of people. Die in this episode, just like people in the episode. This get killed. Yeah, uh, it's a bit of a change. It's not everyone gets stunned and everyone gets to live at the end. This is just like a, a express train to murder town the whole way. At this point in the story is when. Jennifer Lean starts to have to lean into her new persona that she's going to be playing for most of the rest of the episode, which is essentially that her body has been taken over by this warlord figure that is the reference in the title uh, named Tyrion. And Tyrion is a very confident, supremely confident, and very manipulative person. Uh, and is obviously very different from the demure, quiet, uh, naive Kess. And so he is now, he is now being reflected through Kess, and it's calling Jennifer Lean into playing it basically the exact opposite of what she usually does. And from the beginning, she is committed to it, and you can t- feel the difference in everything that she does. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, bang the gavel right now and just call to order. <laughs> what is pretty much going to be the Jennifer Lean fan club. Yeah. Uh, moving forward. And we talked about it in the mess hall and it's come up a few other times. You know, I certainly came in with a, with a bad impression of Kess and lean. She has not disappointed me in anything I'd seen up to this point. I thought Kess has been one of the strongest parts of Voyager through the first three seasons and them giving her what is essentially a dark mirror episode. Uh, really does not disappoint at all. So these three people they beam off this shuttle that was about to explode are in fact terrorist fugitives who have been fleeing the authority of their planet. And uh, when this guy was on his deathbed, like you said, he had a trick up his sleeve, literally, whereas he is able to throw his consciousness into another host if there's physical contact. The woman who had claimed to be his wife was in fact his terrorist bride and then the doctor uh is a legit doctor who was behind uh facilitating these body swaps and their goal was to get mobile again meet back up with this uh warlord Tyrion's um rebel forces and steal some swanky federation technology along the line the one hole i could poke in this is that uh, this guy seems, while he's possessing Kess, to have full knowledge of all of her memories and perhaps an even better understanding of her capabilities than she does. But the fact that she's got this advanced working knowledge, I guess it's not surprising. You see what a voracious reader she is and how much medical, surgical knowledge she's been able to assimilate over a year or so under the doctor. I guess it's not really that big of a stretch that she would be a, you know, an advanced level computer user in Federation technology as well and able to program shuttles and and all this other complicated stuff that completely pulls the wool over Tuvok and Chakotay's eyes. Yeah, I I bought the premise that because of the ruthlessness of Tyrion, he's able to basically maximize or better utilize Kess's vast powers 
We see that quite a bit in some pretty cool ways through the episode. Immediately, he has a grasp on her her uh, kind of psychic torture ability. Yes. Uh, that we saw initially with Tuvok's fucking blood getting boiled. Yes. And so I I bought it like that. He was able to do all this because while Kess may not have really put together all the pieces to know how to do all of that herself, he has the mind to use that knowledge in such a way to pull that that black ops mission off and she is just bullying the shit out of this guy they pull up from the rebel force immediately like starting to, to force choke his brain yeah. and is like i have your loyalty don't i and he's like oh okay yeah no problem you got you got a boss you're the chief you're the boss you're the boss guy you're the boss lady you're, you're good <laughs> they, it's good times 10 out of 10 they pull up over this moon or whatever and yeah, they pull one of his lackeys up, who's some self-serving jerk. Reminds and, me of uh, uh, Forrest Whitaker yes! from Battlefield Earth. Yes, what the guy reminded me of. Minus a lazy eye. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> pulls him up and she starts popping off orders. He's like, oh, shit, don't even tell me that's Tyrion. She's like, you better fucking believe it. And I'm in charge. And he's like, yeah, but you're in this little girl's body and I'm not going to listen to you. And she's like, well, turns out this little girl has psychic assault. And like you said, she just hits him with the dark side. And I want to go back to the prosthetics on their face because here's where they shine. She puts this guy under the force grip and he is on the floor like, they start zooming in and these four tubes coming down over his nose start spurting blood everywhere. And I think it's like that rule that if it looks kind of alien, it can get by sensors or whatever. But man, this dude's nose tubes are just a bloody mess. And like you said, he caves like a house of cards. He's like, yeah, uh, turns out I'm perfectly fine with a little girl being my boss again. Please stop squeezing all my blood out through my face. And uh, we get back over to Voyager, who has kind of had a chance to recuperate. Um, they've beamed another representative off the planet up. And uh, I forget what this guy's name is, but he's kind of a douche. And he starts, you know, laying out what's going on to Janeway saying, hey, we've got this uh, folklore hero who can kind of jump between bodies. And he's been alive for 200 years. He's an old war hero. But he became corrupt and we had to overthrow him. And he has just been a big pain in our ass. It sucks. He killed my family member. And um yeah, I think yeah. there's a lot of danger here. We may have skipped ahead a little too much. So this guy is named uh, uh, Demis, I believe. And this planet has the most paper thin, ridiculous politics that I've seen in fiction since Black Panther. Like, I hated the idea that Wakanda's super advanced super science technology uh, utopia has a kingship system based on doing uh you know bare knuckle stone age fighting at a waterfall uh likewise this this planet-wide monarchy of the the autark seems to like some dude can just roll into the palace with like eight guys and just kill everybody and and then he's in charge now like this is no way to run a planet this is ridiculous uh, but that's what happens is that the the heir to the throne goes to Voyager, explains the backstory. Meanwhile, uh, Kess as Tyrion and, and his his little band beam into Imperial headquarters and just murders the old the king and all of his friends, except his son, importantly, his like his youngest son. And then he Kess puts on this this little collar and says, all right, I'm the king again. So what's up? Yeah, I won. I won. I won the fight at the waterfall by shooting a guy with a phaser. Feels good. Is good. Praxis. Yeah, Praxis. She, Claire's Praxis. She walks right up to the king, like at the dinner table, pulls her gun out, is like, "By the way, fuck you." Shoots the guy in his heart. <laughs> her dude yeah. comes up behind the back, and you know, my comment in my notes is like, "How convenient that the royal gorget." It's like this four piece plate mail choker right is perfectly sized for a little girl's neck 
it just fits like a glove. Um, the very next scene is my favorite, though. Because the next scene, they cut back. They're still in this Imperial Palace. And Kess slash Tyrion has had opportunity to make a wardrobe change. Mm. And this is where Jennifer Lean, she was at an eight and she kicks it all the way to an 11. Because apparently uh, the the new look is black leather with black boots. leather military gear. It is it is Kess at maximum vamping. Yeah. And and Tyrion is just just like all about flaunting i would call it a raw sexuality yes which is so fucking weird yeah that it's kess but jennifer lean is just like not 100 percent committed no holding back i'm a professional watch this shit and she does it and it's it's awesome so here's where it gets weird because this this old warlord and i see in my notes i end up calling these guys salami heads because <laughs> that looks like <laughs> A patchwork of lunch meats, like Italian cold cuts, salamis and bolognis <laughs> glued to people's heads. I like it. This war warlord salami head is in this little girl now. And, you know, he's got them hanging up his old pictures all over the place. So you see what this dude used to look like. I don't know if over the course of his 200 years, if he has had to inhabit other female bodies before. Um, but let's assume for the moment he's just stuck to guys because that's his thing. But man, he gets into Kess's skin and he feels right at home. Where if I suddenly found myself in a little girl, uh, I don't know, I would still be wearing like dude clothes. And like you said, he she just jumps right into those thigh high hooker boots and starts getting real slinky and catty. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, I feel like she this, goes, <laughs> I feel like the script is like. Okay, in this episode, uh, Jennifer, your character Kess is going to become an evil warlord who does mean things. And she's like, cool, I'm going to become a vampire. I'm going to become a sexy <laughs> vampire. And people are like, no, you're, you're like this crotchety old military expert. No, no I'm going to be a slinky cat and I'm going to crawl around. I'm going to talk real close and I'm going to let the sexy time out because this is my Dark Mirror episode. We're going to see what evil Kess is like. No, no, no. You're not evil Kess. You're like a warlord in Kess's body. She's like, but hooker boots and close talking and playing with hair. So the whole time I'm watching. We know how much we love close talking. Oh, and we have Janeway do it all the time. Janeway does it like. I don't know, not not super sexy, timely. And this guy's like, I got this new body Except with herself during during parallels. Well, yeah, with herself she had that moment. Yeah. She had that moment with herself where that makeout was right there. I'm not going to go back into deleted footage to recover that. But so she's doing this and it works and it's great. But, you know, in your head, like this is like some old warlord, dude. And she starts crawling all over the younger prince of the planet because she wants him to get on board with her new regime, because if he sides on board and says, hey, the old regime supports the new warlord again. It adds this big chunk of legitimacy and will allow him to consolidate his power base. So he starts trying to go after this, you know, political marriage. But that's not the way he's selling it. He's selling it for like, hey, you get on board with this uh, this new regime and not only do you get some power, but we're also going to start having sex. And hey, check out these boots. <laughs> and it's like, man, this guy is not hesitating to crawl all over the son of his. I, I don't know what, what the gender gender role socialization is on this planet, but it's either it's real loosey goosey uh, or this guy just doesn't give a fuck. Uh, all everything you said is spot on what happens. I, I don't know if the head canon here is that Taryn has been both men and women, so he's just good no matter what, or that this is his first time in a lady and he's just kind of leaning in to whatever's going on because his his memories and his uh, neural pathways may, as we understand, sort of uh, 
adapt to whatever situation it's in. Ooh. So, you know, if he's in a lady, he's got lady feelings now. He's just now he's a sexy vampire. I don't know. I don't know which it is, but they decided to go with sexy vampire. I I choose to see it as Tyrion is just done this for 200 years. He's been in so many different bodies. He's is he's like Dax. And Jadzia is just she's 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 a good times lady on DS9. She's been both men and women, so she's she is not uh she's not got she got no problems. And they do a head fake, we're gonna do a quick steaming lesbian makeout before she pivots and immediately is is basically telling the son of the old king we're we're gonna bang if you want to bang let me kind of like drape myself over you so that you can consider the banging they uh they're not wasting any time yeah it's uh it's good it all works really well it doesn't feel like exploitive or stupid it feels like wow okay this whatever's going on here is some shit i started watching it just kind of tune some of that out as this is just evil cast doing evil stuff and, and i'm here for some hot vampire evil chickness um there is a good side story going on in this that Tyrion's wife who was there you know as his rebel lieutenant she's still there in the corner and she's kind of like you know uh this is a big change and yesterday you were a dude and now you're like this little space elf girl and she's Kess is like you're right. I didn't even stop to consider the impact this is having on you. I'm sure this is all a, a big system shock, but I assure you, it's still the same old Tyrion in here. I love you. You know how much I depend on you. Everything's going to be great. And also now we're going to be in this uh, three way. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, I don't want to spoil. You know what? Fuck it. It's too good not to at this point. The At the very end of the episode. Kess as Tyrion is trying to set up a three-way between her, his old wife and her new husband. No implications. This is verbatim. Yeah, like, no, we're all gonna bang together. We're This is happening. This is my plan, is for all of us just to have a big fuck pile, and uh, that's what I want. It's, uh, it was bold. So stuff's getting real steamy down on the surface. And uh, we go back up to the top, and yeah, you've got this guy's uh, what is now basically the legitimate heir of the planet. And he's pleading his case to Janeway and Janeway, Kate Mulgrew sitting behind the table. And I love her face while he's like laying this all on the table. Like, and she's got this real like, I don't give a fuck about any of this look on her face. Her interest is in the fact that Kess has been kidnapped. He lays out on the table that... Um, you know how the technology works that this guy is able to jump between bodies. They have the old dead guy in sick bay. They find out he's got this uh, neural optic wiring that runs along his arm to his palm from his brain and that he is able to establish physical contact and possess people. The guy says, you know, Kess is probably gone and we need to proceed forward because obviously this guy doesn't want to pull punches. He wants Right. Warlord it's it's your standard, dead. I want to murder the problem. <coughs> yeah. And, I want to and nuke the, it from orbit cruise. with your advanced Federation technology. And Janeway's like, yeah, but we got to give peace a chance and this and that. I got to go rescue my one dude. And yeah. And whatever. This is a very common. Never mind uh, the Star fact Trek that trope. my ensign is dead and, you know, murdered in cold blood. <laughs> um, At no point does she have anything to say about starfleet protocol for getting involved in uh civil wars oh yeah they just go ahead and decide to get involved i mean mm-hmm. when it comes down to it they throw in they absolutely do they're out there rolling into this palace murdering the shit out of the locals so I've, that I, they have disposed of that pretense but uh to make a the the long story short upon voyager is they launch into a plan using what they found out about how uh, Tyrion is is spreading himself. He basically has this neural enhancement surgery that he has done on whatever body he's in so that he can transfer himself, as you were mentioning. And the doctor comes up with a way to essentially suppress that through a little dongle that gets placed on whoever uh, uh, is presently uh, uh, possessed by the dude to force it out. 
and they want to put it on Kess. And as you might expect, it is Tuvok who volunteers to go down to the planet to sneak his way in and essentially stick this on Kess and then bail out with her. It wouldn't have been anybody else. And we cut back down and Taryn is trying to deal with some headaches because as you can probably uh, have guessed, Kess is not going quietly into the night and is fighting back and Taryn is having headaches. She's obviously struggling with Kess and he kind of perks up all of a sudden because again, because Taryn's got kind of a, a better grasp of being, I guess, ruthlessness and being in other people's brains. He has tapped into Kess's latent psychic powers in a way that Kess has never really been able to stably and consistently do and has psychically picked up on Tuvok's presence. She says as much as she goes from guard to guard, lifting up their little like face veils that they're wearing on these stupid ass helmets. Ultimately, of course, Tuvok tries to sneak up behind and put the dongle on Kess, but is immediately stopped. It's kind of a shitty attempt. And, uh, we get my favorite uh, conversational scene that uh, that happens uh, in the episode, and that's a, a interrogation between Tuvok and Tyrion slash Kess. Because this is like maximum vampire moment, right? Because now Kess is going to try and lower Tuvok's defenses by psychically like destroying those things that prevent his emotions from coming forth while pointing out the emotions he's feeling and it's so cool like again jennifer lean is awesome and is able to deploy the sinister feeling in her dialogue that she's connecting with in a way that is uncommon to us from watching voyager and sells you know, the, the, the truth behind what she's saying about what Tuvok's feeling. And then to Tim Russ's credit, he has to act with his back to the camera with facial like motions to indicate his instability for the first like 30 seconds of the scene to add to what she's doing. And it comes together. Great. This had to be a really fun scene. Um, manipulative, I think is the word you were looking for. We've seen, evil Kess play a few things. We've seen her play the sexy angle. We've seen her play the violent, crazy angle. We've seen her play the, the humane good husband angle. And now we're seeing the master manipulator at work. So she really gets to, to go through the entire spectrum here. And I, I think that this had to be a lot of fun to do in this scene. It puts both characters in places. You don't frequently find them. Certainly you see Tuvok getting physically tortured on a regular basis. I also want to point out that this becomes yet another jailbreak episode for Voyager. Yep. Yep. This might even be a double threat because Kess is hostage and yo dog, we heard you like jailbreak episodes. So we put Tuvok in jail under the person who was already in jail. So you've got people in jail who were put in jail. Um, and yeah, the the acting is top notch in this little interrogation. Uh, her picking at him and and abusing him emotionally is neat, and the whole thing just plays off really, really well. She the the kind of denouement of the of the scene is when Kesslash uh, Tyrion tries to turn it to seduction, yeah, and suggest that Tuvok has had sexy thoughts about Kess, which he denies and, you know, kind of gets all up on him and starts kind of like rubbing her hands on him and then kind of grabs his face and, and, and kisses him, <laughs> which is, which is the moment that Tuvok has been waiting for the entire time to get her in a Vulcan uh, mind meld grip and pull Kess's psyche to the forefront. Yeah. See the Vulcans are, the masters of the play it cool seduction philosophy. Oh yes. <laughs> and Tyrion just was not ready for that at all. Um, I also want to point out something that this, at this junction, 
what I really love about the script and this story is the acknowledgement that Kess is so much more powerful than anything we have really been led to believe. Like, yeah, she, you know, psychically beat up the, the mind trap guy, but they show that, you know, Kess is capable of so much more and whether Kess simply can't control it. Or I think the real thing is that she is, willfully avoided it because she knows it could hurt people and that she's afraid of becoming that thing. But they show she's just a super powerful character that they choose not to use in that fashion. And, you know, she could be such a terrible Mary Sue, not only in mental capacity, but in, you know, super paranormal feats as well. And, and they don't. And I think that's really neat. I like the untapped potential part of Kess and that now they are kind of exploring that more explicitly. Um, As we hit an hour here, I'm just going to put the gas because I think we've done everything that's interesting about the episode. Uh, We uh, we see more of the breakdown of Kess starting to puncture through Tuvok appeals to her to like keep fighting, keep at it. Don't stop. Don't quit. You can beat him before Tyrion reasserts himself. But then they finally have that sequence you were talking about where they confront each other and basically... There's cool lore that the Doctor is like, what's going on? The host is rejecting you. And he's like, it's not a big deal. He's like, it is a big deal. Keep in mind, every other host you've ever had has basically been a part of your cult and has willingly surrendered themselves to you. So not only did you pick someone who is not down with being possessed, but is also... Uh, kind of an off the charts psychic. So we need to get you out of this body because it is not going to work out. And this Tyrion guy's fatal flaw is pride. He's like, I am not going to go down to some little girl. I've survived for 200 years and this and that. I'm the best and we're going to make this happen. Also, I don't want to give up her sweet psychic assault powers because those are pretty badass. <clears throat> and the guy outs him. He's like, when's the last time you fell asleep? And he's like, Ah, I don't need to sleep. Of course, the guy falls asleep and we get treated to of course. another really cool scene because you've had Kess just being completely off the rails, evil vampire. And now it goes to sleep and it's this. I don't know if you noticed what they did with the set, but on one half of the room, you got Kess saying, hey, get out of my head and leave me alone. I hate you. On the other hand, side, we have what Tyrion is supposed to look like. And on the Tyrion side, we have this imperial throne room that he's sitting in. But Kessa's side is her quarters back in Voyager where she's sitting on her bed. And as they start arguing and going back and forth and Kess is like, uh, you know, Kess is obviously starting to have a bit of Tyrion rub off on him because run off on her rather because she gets ruthless with him to say, like, I'm never going to stop trying to beat you. You know, eventually I will win. You will lose to me. This is my brain. This is my body. I will be relentless. I will be merciless. And eventually I'm going to overcome you. And that's what's up. And it's it's cool the way they play it that through the implication that Cass has be, started to change herself. Like that is her psyche starting to torture Tyrion's psyche with the kinds of, of relentlessness that Tyrion's whole bag is. Along with that, and, the the scene play that I was talking about, where like her side of the room was a bedroom and his side was a throne room. By the end, where she's just bullying him hard, the entire room is her bedroom. Like she has taken over that scene uh, fully in that moment. It's a nice bit of subtle filmmaking in an If Wager episode, which is nice when they when they do stuff like that, and we can appreciate it. It doesn't always have to be paint by numbers, and I. I I will applaud it every time we see it. Ultimately, we get uh, kind of the resolution that you would expect. That is, Kess eventually Voyager throws in with with the douchey guy. They storm the castle. Uh, you know, Tyrion's control over Kess gets worse and worse and worse and breaks down. And Kess starts sending like warnings and starts interfering with what Tyrion's trying to do. And eventually, they succeed, of course, and. Tyrion's, getting Tyrion pulled out of him. Tyrion's going crazy too. He's like, his world is falling apart around him. He's like, no, everybody's going to stay in this party. We're going to have this, <coughs> this three way between the younger prince and my wife and me. It's going to be real sexy. We're not deploying troops anywhere. Meanwhile, in uh, Tuvok's jail, 
we have yet another daring jailbreak. This time it's uh, it's uh, uh, Paris running in there. He's got the big fuck you Voltron rifle. He's shooting dudes. <laughs> right, They're having yep. a good time. People are getting judo flipped. The entire bridge, like the entire Voyager senior crew is involved in the Civil War. There's nobody on the ship. You got Chakotay. You got Paris. You got Janeway. Everybody's down there shooting dudes fighting trying to close in on kess's position you see all of the members of the warlords regime getting gunned down by phaser fire they're not really clear if this is like stun setting or not but i'm gonna s- i can't speak that, for the federation people but it's pretty clear that- alpha says everyone was getting killed and that like janeway specifically murdered uh Tyrion's wife Really? Like that was that was Phaser was set to kill, and that 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 woman is dead. That's a pretty big assumption for Memory Alpha to make, but man, that's fucking brutal. A couple other people, I think, get their brains uh, nuked. We got more blood spurting out of nose pipes. It's a it's a real slaughterhouse down there. And and if yeah, you know, Tyrion I'll, ends up uh, as K- Tyrion is slash cast ends up murdering the doctor that keeps implanting the the brain juice. Yeah. machine by giving him an aneurysm and straight up like just bursting his brain and just blood flows through the nose nostrils and the eyes and all that he's just laying there just like having obviously just been killed and she just sits there and starts like talking to herself i mean the, the spiral of madness like everything else in this episode is remarkably well played on jennifer lean's part it sells the whole thing as a very uh for a very paint by numbers ending is very satisfying and I liked the scene they end with. They end the episode essentially on Tuvok and Kess having a, a decompression session and Kess being like, I can't do it. Like, I can't I can't center myself. I can't do anything right now because I went through all this fucked up shit. It was awful. It was terrible. How am I supposed to go back to my life the way that it was? And Tuvok goes, you fucking don't. You've experienced sexy cat Char- character growth <laughs> you can't go sexy- back <laughs> once you go sexy cat you can't go back you've been a sexy vampire Kess. it stains you once you've done it Spe- i speak from experience Kess. <laughs> once you've been a sexy vampire your whole life changes <laughs> they don't really ever one of the things we gloss over is uh, Neox kind of puts two and two together and figures out that he got dumped after this possession happened. So Neox is all gun ho about getting involved in this rescue party. You think that her and Neox are going to reconcile. And she's going to be like, Hey, sorry, this dude made me say those terrible things to you. That's not the way I feel, but they don't really do it at all. And memory alpha says, and this is kind of what Ethan Phillips brought up uh, at the dragon con panel. They don't, really ever resolve what actually happened here and i'll be curious to see how the rest of the season plays out but from my understanding this is just the end of their relationship and they don't really address it side note uh, since we're always tracking you know the opportunity for the federation to acquire new technology kessa's biggest problem is that she's gonna die like tomorrow because that's what okampa do Uh. i just want to point out that in this case we have installed in her arm a way for her to transfer her consciousness into a new host so yeah and if anyone could possibly do it effectively it would be the super talented ultra psychic yeah might be you know something for them to think about nah, but I'm sorry sure... peter that sounds like some shit they'll never <laughs> mention again yeah pull that <laughs> that's too intri- that's too intriguing for uh future voyager episodes pull that let's go ahead possession and that one gauntlet. fucking memory hole yeah, yeah. Pull the possession gauntlet, throw it right next to the cryo cryo chamber and warp 10 and all that other silly willy bullshit in there. Yeah, our psychic now has brain transfer power, so let's never speak of it. This was a badass episode. I loved it. I love the opening, Uh, all the the goofy holodeck stuff. I love the Neelix Kess dump scene. I loved sexy kitty cat vampire hooker boot kess <laughs> i loved all the phaser battles that's gonna be the name of the episode is sexy <laughs> no no kitty vampire hooker boot kess. the name of this episode is gonna be leaning in hard it got bad reviews and i don't understand why whoa yeah what 
What? Yeah, it's like two out of fives and, and shit like that on Memory Alpha. What the fuck? I, I don't Have know. Have they seen the other episodes of this fucking season? This is the best by far that we've seen. So I, I don't know if I'm just... Maybe I got brainwashed at some point and I'm stuck in a cult of Kess, but... If that's the case, I'm right there with you. This was solid. I, I was not as in love with the opening as you were. I thought it was just... The headcanon was funny. Like, I'm... I kept pausing it, it every great. like few seconds when I was watching it with Stevie. And we we're like, holy shit, this is like some serious sex toy, sex fantasy, Federation freaky geeky shit. Like, I'm sorry, it wasn't the good. It was fuck. very, very entertaining. I want like the with Balana adding her fucking two cents. I was all that. I mean, yeah, it was very entertaining uh, for us, for the way that we've decided to, but to you had explore that phaser fights. You had bikinis. You had shuttle thefts you had jail breaks i mean it's it's everything you, you could have in psychic Voyager. trauma oh you yeah had brain aneurysms two of them you had you had explicit demands for three ways you had Point sexy lesbian murder. head fakes yeah this this <laughs> this show had everything so yeah we're saying i guess watch this one this was a good one uh it's best one season three has to offer yeah. and uh, a definite solidification of Jennifer Lean not only being vastly underappreciated, but being bar none, hands down, the best part of Voyager that we have seen to date. Which is all the more tragic that she's on the way out the door. I also do want to throw in there was one cool part to the political situation in this. <clears throat> they established Tyrion. He's not really the biggest piece of shit. Like, He's a dick, but like he totally lets he could have blown Voyager up with his fleet. And he's like, let him go. They didn't ask to be a part of this. They did save my life. I did kill one of their crew members. I don't have beef with these guys. Um, he makes a big deal out of keeping his word. He's pushing for like new libraries and stuff for poor people to fix the bad conditions. Like there's no clear like right or wrong side to the government, which I thought is why they needed to have a scene in there about like what's Federation morals say about supporting the civil war, because the guy they end up backing is a piece of garbage. And I think that had uh, the warlord not shot a couple people on Voyager first and kidnapped one of their people, I'd almost be in his camp. Yeah. It's hard to tell exactly how much of what his more reasonable actions are Kess influencing Mm. him or what he chose to do. Good point. Uh, that that's up in the air but they do mention that you know he managed to unite the whole planet and see them through a very difficult time so it could also be that he was legit a good leader that just was uh had some unfortunate uh deficiencies when it came to uh persecution complexes that led to his downfall so i think fleshing hard to tell interesting idea fleshing that stuff out would have come at the cost of other very juicy content that I would have preferred to see. So I think they handled this the right way. I, I'll, I'll give credit where credit's due. This was a Lisa Klink script. This was uh, what's his name? David Livingston as the director. We just shit on them from some other script previous. So uh, good job and, and good direction on both those guys. Yeah, this was uh, doing it right. Pretty much from beginning to end. Yep. And now I, I I know what's next because I saw Netflix. Man, I know what you're gonna say, and I dread the next thing that I'm about to tell you, Peter. But we must we must do this as we have dedicated ourselves to the task, and that means, Peter, I need you to tell me what the next episode is. It's gonna be season three, episode eleven. I see Neelix with his back to us. I see Q. Q is wearing some sort of a yuppie popped collar yellow polo with a red sweater on top of it. The Q in the gray. After Winnie the Q's death in his last meeting with Voyager, a new Q must be produced, and the mischievous Q known to the Enterprise wants Janeway as his mate. What the fuck? <laughs> is this the beginning of the end? Uh, this is probably bottom three of Voyager overall material. Uh, this is one of the worst things I've ever seen. 
the damage that was done to the Q in Death Wish is nothing. Nothing. Compared to what we're about to witness. Well, if we got to go in... Because it's going for your balls. If we got to go in on a stinker, uh, at least we're we're leaving on a pretty high note with Warlord. I actually have a rule of acquisition. It's fucking bad, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I got a rule of acquisition for Warlord, though. And I think it's one of the most appropriate ones. Keep in mind, uh, the Warlord has sidelined his wife, who is now going to be his secret concubine, who he depends on to help lead his armies. Uh, he's bringing in this guy's little brother to move him up in rank and, you know, assume a, a station that he never would have with his older brother in power. Frankie rule of acquisition number 139. Wives serve, brothers inherit. <laughs> ah, that's a good one. Yeah. That's a good like one. That you one. reach deep for that. I like it. Yep. All right, man. Thank you for joining us on VG Please, a hateful voyage to the Delta Quadrant. We want to thank Ian and Sarah, as always, for our lovely theme music. We want to thank you for your participation in the live stream, whether it be in our Facebook group, the Beach Please Drama Support Group, that everyone is welcome to. And by the way, if for whatever reason you've asked to join and I have approved it, it's for some reason sometimes requests don't penetrate. We don't see them. Just message us. Let us know. We want to love you have part of the discussions that we have on there. Uh, and you can always email us at vgerplease at gmail.com or reach us on Twitter at vgerplease. We've been a little bit more active there recently, yeah. so be happy to chat with you about Trek stuff between episodes. And we will see you next time. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>